ahead and worship together.
Pastor Ricky and Pastor Josh with you. Tanner quit. He's gone. That's right. No, he's going to be with us shortly. Well, not with us. You'll see him in a little bit. But hey, thank you guys so much for joining us online today. We are so excited to be with you uh, this Sunday. We've got some announcements, yep. some things that we would like to share. Uh, so first off, if you are a first-time guest today, thank you so much for joining us. It is such an honor to have you with us. I want to let you know about a few things uh, so that you can get connected here today. Uh, so first off, there is a chat on the side of your screen somewhere. Um, and this chat, probably over here, that's right, we always guess, but you know, this chat is available for for you to connect with people, um, just to interact and have some community. Um, in that chat, if you would just let us know that it is your first time, we just want to welcome you again. We are so glad to have you with us. Um, also, for everybody else, that chat is going to have some links in it um, that are for first time guests and for anybody who is looking to take a next step. So make sure, please make sure that you're looking for those links. Hosts will be sending them out throughout of the message. Um, also, if you're looking for next steps, we have a drop down menu at the top of your screen that you can click on and follow to links to our website and other things that you can do um, to take a next step and get more connected here at Grace Fellowship Church. Hey, a reminder for everybody that we have a couple of ways that you can give today. So you can give online at our website, um, which is gracelawton.org, or you can text to give, um, and you can do this by texting the number 84321. Super easy to use and set up. Great ways to do that, so thank you guys for doing that today. We've got some extra stuff as well that uh, I'm going to hand it over to this guy. Yeah, so everybody's asking us about the reopen of the church, of the church building. Uh, so many of you guys have been um, signing on with us every single week and doing worship with us yeah. and just tracking with the church and staying plugged in and we appreciate it so much. But many of you have been asking, is like, is it time yet? And we think, we think, we think that it is almost time for us just to reopen. Like we're so super close and we're really excited. We're trying to get everything ready for you guys to come back. Um, but first we wanted to uh, talk about our congregation just for a second and um, have a conversation just quickly yeah. about the fact that um, many of our, our people in our congregation are in different places, have different perspectives right now. And I just want to call some of those out. First off, uh, maybe some of you guys are in a place of frustration and you are just so done just with this quarantine thing and you're done with all the political opinions out there and all the health opinions that are out really? there and, 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 and you're just in a frustrated place. You just like this to be over. Uh, another group of you are fearful slash concerned maybe and, and and you would just like to stay in your cave. Thank you very much. That, like, that's that's right. your spot. You're not asking me about reopen maybe nearly as much um, you're just you, you still got some concerns the third group of you is um, suspicious um, there have been so many different things said and you're just not sure that you trust anybody at this point because because <laughs> there are so many different perspectives out there and it makes you uh, suspicious the very last one is you're just desperate desperate for this to be done desperate to get back to church desperate to be around people and not to just be staring That's at the right. same family members you've been staring at for the last eight weeks God bless them right Anyway, uh, what I want to say to you as a pastor here is that um, we are one congregation. Yeah. And the fact that we are one congregation in Christ is a bigger deal than, than whatever camp we might find ourselves in. Yeah. There are so many camps, uh, but we are one congregation and it means something to me and I think it means something to Christ that we are one family and that that is a higher issue for us. And because we care about you, because we want to understand you as re we reopen this church, we've created a survey and it's already been available since last Friday. We're going to keep it available through through this coming Tuesday, but it's a survey just to ask you and your family, uh, where are you guys at? Yeah. What's your perspective? What are you comfortable with? What are you not comfortable with? Because we really want to make sure that there's a family conversation that takes place as we reopen this church. So, um, so also yeah. want to let you know just another value for us is respect. Uh, we plan every step of the way as we reopen our church to respect you. Uh, respect the decisions that you make for your family. So I'm going to give you my personal guarantee that we are not going to do any arm twisting at all. Uh, there'll be no arm twisting for you coming back to the church building, no arm twisting for you serving in kids, for you serving in first impressions, for you doing anything that you don't feel comfortable to do. Um, we do not want anybody to feel pressured during this situation. It's super important that you guys make your decisions. So you want to talk about the phase one of reopening? Absolutely. So um, we actually have more info that's going to be coming on this, like Pastor Josh said. It was great job. Look at this guy. Great job. You should lead a church or something. It's amazing. <laughs> so. Phase one of reopen is going to look like a lot of things, and we are still again in the process of answering all the questions that we even have as to what it's going yeah. to look like. Um, when it comes to things like kids ministry, what is kids gonna, ministry going to look like on a Sunday mm -hmm. as we reopen? What does coffee look like? You know, coffee is like a part of church. 
can't do church to church, right? It's like, we're trying to figure that out. So we're walking that line, trying to figure out how we do that safely, um, how we reopen well with wisdom in all those areas, wearing masks, everything you can think of. We're in that process of figuring out what is the best way, um, praying, asking for wisdom, seeking wisdom, and, and just hoping to have good discernment in how we do this to make sure that we reopen, that we reopen well, um, and so, so that we can all be together and enjoy the service and be back together at church and have a good time. So, so look for some big information coming yeah. into your inboxes, maybe on social, social media, media. Uh, to describe Thanks. all that to you because <laughs> some of you guys, your decision on whether or not you would come back to church may have to do with some of that detail that That's you're right. talking about. Absolutely. So. so just to let you guys know, um, with all of this being said and with, uh, with the phases that have been placed um, by our governing officials over our state, um, our plan as of now is to reopen on June the 7th. So that is next Sunday. We are that close, right? So as long as things keep getting better and we keep moving in the direction that we have been for a while now, um, we will be open next Sunday for service. So we are very much so looking forward to seeing you there. So again, like Pastor Josh said, just make sure you're tracking with us on social media, looking on our website, getting emails, all that stuff, because we will let you know. We're going to be reaching out and spreading the word as much as we possibly can, because we want to see you guys. We want to see you guys. We want to go to church. We want to worship Jesus together. Um, also, for anybody who's like maybe back to that idea of camps, if you're like, hey, I'm ready to, or I'm not ready to, to, to be in a service yet, but I still want to be at church online. Yeah. It's like, we are going to have that available and potentially forever. We want to be streaming. We have um, yes. invested so much into the streaming uh, that we are doing here at Grace Fellowship Church because we care about that. We know people um, need that at home right now or in that space. So, hey, we want to make sure that you are welcome and that you have a way to get to church on a Sunday as well. So streaming will continue. Maybe forever. Forever. Hopefully. That's what we're mm -hmm. looking for. So yeah. forever and ever, right? Even when we don't know. Okay, that's, that's just weird. Whatever, dude. Okay, so guys, thank you so much uh, for everything. One last thing we want to let you know is that um, next Sunday when we join back together, if, that, if that's what happens, we will be starting a brand new series called Welcome Back to Wholeness. So we are looking forward to having you there. Join us for the start of this series. Welcome back to church. It's going to be great. But for today, it's time to jump into Pastor our Tanner. last week yes. uh, with Pastor Tanner. So we will see you guys. Have a good one. Well, hey, Grace Fellowship. So, uh, so, so good to be with you. Like they said, my name is Tanner. I'm one of the pastors here. And as always, such an honor and a privilege to, to be with you. Hope you're comfortable wherever you're watching this. Get some coffee or whatever drink you like. And uh, we're going to do church together right now. So we are, this is the last uh, sermon in this series called You Asked For It. And I've loved this series and I love it every time we do it. And we do this series because all of us have questions. And all of us come to the table with different things we're curious about when it comes to the Bible and God. And so we tried to tailor this series around those questions that we all have. And uh, it's, been, it's been an incredible time. And this Sunday, we're going after the question is just basically, what is the book of Revelation? What is up with the end times? What is happening with those two things? And so we are going to dive into that. It's going to be a lot of fun. It doesn't sound fun to talk about the end of the world, but it is going to be fun. And uh, so we're going to do that together. But we're going to pray right now, and then we're going to jump on in. So let's pray together. Jesus, we love you so much. And God, we're so grateful for the moments that we get to share right here together. Father, I thank you that wherever we're gathered uh, together today, Father, that you are with us, God, that you're bringing us together into a community. God, I, I thank you that you are in so much control, God, that, that you know every single person, every single situation, God. You know what the need is across this congregation. And so, God, I, I pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, Father, that, that you would um, use this word, God, you would use this message, Father, to, to, to speak to people. God, that whatever people are going through, God, that they would receive encouragement today. God, that whatever's happening in their world, God, that, that they would experience more hope and wholeness and freedom today, God, because they met with you. So God, I pray ultimately that we are all changed and different after this encounter with you. God, please don't let us miss it. God, let us tune in, let us focus, and let us hear what you have to say for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So obvious statement coming at you right here. Uh, I'm in Lawton, Oklahoma right now, okay? That's where I live. That's where this church is, Lawton, Oklahoma. If you're not from Lawton or you're watching online and you don't live here, one of the things about Lawton, Oklahoma is that we have Fort Sill Army Base right here in Lawton, Oklahoma. And uh, it's an Army Base. It's a really, really large. And uh, it's, it's a huge part of being in this community, our military people and military families. Uh, so much of our church is made up of military people and military families. And so many of the people that you just do life with that you're in relationship or in the military. One of the things I've noticed about people in the military is that they have their own language, okay? They don't speak English. 
they, they have what I call military lingo, okay? And when you talk to them, you ask them about their life. I have a friend, her name is Britt. She's awesome. She's in my life group. She's super cool. And um, when I talk to her about her life and how's work, what's going on, she, she tells me, but I don't understand at all what she said, right? Every word is shortened into something else. There's a bunch of acronyms. They're the most creative people with the alphabet I've ever come into contact with, right? They, there's an acronym for everything. Sometimes the acronym is even longer than what if they would just say it normal, but that's beside the point. So it's, it's a language that I don't understand. And so Britt's telling me about work and what's going on, and I'm nodding, but I'm like, I have no clue what you're saying to me right now. Another thing like this for me is math, okay? Math is another language I don't understand. I don't know if you're a math person. If you are, that's great, and we don't get each other, but that's all right. I don't get math at all, and especially they started bringing, like, I, I've probably stopped around multiplication, right? That's where I, my comprehension stopped, but then they started bringing letters into it, and I was like, the alphabet doesn't make sense either in the military or in math, okay? So, like, I don't know why we're using so many letters, but it was this language that I just don't understand. I don't have a category in my brain to understand what's being said to me. And I remember being in this math class in college, and, and for, I don't know, for whatever reason, I feel like most of the class were people like me that really struggled, so I felt really bad for our teacher. And she was trying one day to just, like, connect with us and, and make math real. And she was saying stuff like, math is practical, and you can use it in everyday life, and it makes sense. And so, for her example, she was like, so let's say, yeah, math is practical. You use it every day. Let's say one day you wanted to know what the population density of Europe is. I'm like, nobody wants to know what the population density of Europe is, okay? That's not practical whatsoever. Math is a language I don't understand. I don't have a category for it. So I've got two options with military lingo and mathematics, okay? Two options that I can do. My first option is I can wing it, okay? And I can listen to Brit or my math instructor and just say, okay, I'm just going to interpret this with no actual knowledge of what you're saying. And I'm just going to make up what I think you're talking about, and I'm just going to come up with an answer, which is why my math tests are the way they are, because I would just make up an answer, because I don't get it. So, uh, B, you know? And um, that's what I would do. It's so true. I remember, like, literally on tests, when they'd be like, there's five minutes left, I'd go B, 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 all the way down. So one of them had to be right. So I've got my two options, right? My first option is I'm just going to wing it and I'm just going to interpret this with no knowledge, okay? My second option when it comes to military lingo and math is to ask a lot of questions, to hold on, pause. What does that mean? Explain that to me. Give me the background on that. What does that word stand for? Okay, in math, let me go see a tutor. Let me figure it out. Let me play by the rules of whatever it is. Let me, okay, if I'm going to talk about math, let me figure out the rules of math are. If I'm going to talk to somebody who's in the military, let me figure out what they're saying and then interpret it. And then figure out what they're saying based on their rules and not mine. So the book of Revelation is that to you and I. In our 21st century world, the book of Revelation, we do not have a category to understand that book in and of itself. So th this book is written in a style called Jewish apocalypse literature, okay? That is the genre in which it is written in. Okay, so it, it has a style, it has a way that it's written, and you and I, we, don't, we know nothing about this. It's, not, it's extinct. The style of writing doesn't even exist. But the book of Revelation is written in Jewish apocalypse literature format, okay? So the first problem that we're going to run into right off the bat is a language barrier, this word apocalypse, Okay? Jewish apocalypse literature. When you and I hear the word apocalypse, we think immediately the end of the world, right? And it's fire and things are going down, robots figured it out, and they're just, they're just, you know, they're destroying, okay? It's the end of the world. It's the apocalypse. It's scary. It's no good. We don't want any part of it, okay? That's the apocalypse. So the Jewish apocalypse literature, the Greek word in the Bible, apocalypse, doesn't mean that at all. In fact, it's not even close. The, the word apocalypse in the Bible has nothing to do with the end of the world. And so what does this word mean, and how do, how do, we, how do we interpret it? And figuring this out is going to help us so much when it comes to the book of Revelation. So I'm going to read some verses from the New Testament that use this exact same word, apocalypse, and we're going to see what it means, and it's going to help us interpret this book. So the first verse I'm going to read is Matthew 11, verse 25. So I'm going to read it all the way through. And then I'm going to go back and read it again, and I'm going to replace the word apocalypse so we can see what's going on. So, 
Matthew 11, verse 25, this is Jesus. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. So it's a great moment, and Jesus is, is praying, and he's talking about a group of people that think they're wise, think they're clever, and have figured it out, and that things are hidden from them, but that God's actually revealed things to those who are childlike. Really cool moment. So I'm going to read it again now, and I'm going to put Apocalypse where it's supposed to be uh, in, this, in this verse. So at that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for apocalypsing them to the childlike, okay? For apocalypsing them to the childlike. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 is another spot where this word apocalypse shows up. So I'm going to read that now. But even before I was born, this is Paul talking, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to apocalypse his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. So, so Paul's saying that, that God in his grace apocalypsed Jesus to me, okay? And the last verse we're going to look at right now is Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says this, this is a revelation, this is an apocalypse from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we can see from those verses, the word apocalypse in Greek, the word apocalypse we see in the Bible means to reveal. So the word apocalypse is to reveal something. It has a real sort of deep spiritual meaning of God's like pulling back the curtain and, and revealing what's actually happening, showing you something from his perspective. That's what the word apocalypse means in the Bible. And so apocalypse is a really good thing. All of us should want to be apocalypsed every single day. I would love it if I got apocalypsed today. That'd be so great. Uh, that, that just means that, that God's going to reveal something to me, that he's going to peel back the curtain of the reality that I see and show me something from his perspective. Think about salvation for a second. Salvation, obviously, it's different for all of us. All of our stories are different. But the common theme that, that most of us would say in our testimony is that there was a moment where all of a sudden, I feel, I feel like I, I finally actually saw my sin for what it was. And God revealed to me like, oh my gosh, I'm living in brokenness and I'm living in sin and I need to choose Jesus and I need to go after life and life abundant. And so you got apocalypsed and then got saved. Right? God revealed to you what your life was. God revealed to you what your sin is. And so then you chose Jesus. So apocalypse is this revealing. It's the pulling back of the curtain and seeing something from God's perspective. So the book of Revelation is an apocalypse, a revealing from God's perspective for humanity. There are sections of the book of Revelation that are about the end times and that are about what the future holds for us. But the book is not entirely about the end of the world or the end times. There's, there's huge sections of the book that have nothing to do with the end times, and we're going to get into all of that. But suffice it to say for now, we need to separate how the book is written from what it's about. So it's written in Jewish apocalypse literature, which is full of imagery, it's full of uh, symbols, it's full of uh, visions and ideas, and it's, it's super, it's like when you read it, it sounds and feels crazy. And so many of us, like, if, we're, if we're honest right now, we're like, yeah, I've heard things about Revelation, or I've read little bits of it, and it is super weird. There's like Mark of the Beast, and there's some sort of Leviathan in the sea that's going to do something bad, and like, it's just kind of a scary, weird book. And so we're going to look at all of that and, and what those things mean. But the framework for us right now is that Apocalypse is a, is a revealing from God. And he's showing us from his perspective what's happening. The book of Revelation is an apocalypse, a revealing, that has some sections that are about the end times, okay? So how should we read the book? How should we handle it? So we're going to look at the beginning of the book together, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to look at uh, verse 4 in just a second here. So this is going to give us the tools that we need. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says this. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that soon must take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Prophecy is a really important word. We're gonna come back to it in just a second. To the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says for the time is near. Okay, there's already so much to unpack just from those three verses that we read just there. So many things that we need to see about this book. The first thing that, this is just like a nerdy thing that I love, so if you're with me, you're with me. But the first thing that I love here is that it says that this is a revelation, an apocalypse from Jesus, which God gave him. So you've got this really crazy picture of God the Father, like apocalypsing Jesus, revealing to Jesus everything, and then Jesus is now revealing it to John, and then it's being revealed to us. So there's just layers of apocalypsing happening, and I just think that's so cool. So the, but the first main thing that we need to notice in this book and how we need to read it and how we need to understand it is that this is a book about Jesus, okay? This is his revelation. This is an apocalypse from Jesus Christ. This book is about him. It's centered on him. It focuses on him. This book shows how he is going to rule, how he is going to reign, how he is greater and better than everything going on right now. This book is about Jesus so many people will hear Revelation and, oh, it's this book where John talks about all this stuff and John, John, John. John is like this third-party guy who's just kind of sitting there with a pen and paper and God's like, hey, write this down. And he's like, okay, sure, I guess, you know, like I don't even know what's happening right now. Like it's like th this dream sort of state, this vision that John gets. Have you ever like had a dream and then wrote it down and then gone back and looked at it later and been like, what in the world was going on? I had a dream where it was Obi-Wan and me fighting Ring Race on the Death Star, okay? It was a great time, and I would love to get back to that dream, but dreams are weird, right? And you wake up and you're like, I don't even know necessarily what's all going on there. John is in that kind of place, getting this revelation from Jesus and writing it down. But it's a book about Jesus, a revealing about who Jesus is and what he's coming to do. So the next thing, verse 3 shows us that this is a prophecy. And that's really important and super crucial to how we understand the book. And so we're going to get there. Um, and then uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 shows us the last kind of piece that we need for this book. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 says this. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So we have everything we need to actually unpack this book and figure out what's going on and figure out how we need to read it. And so the first thing that we need to see, it's about Jesus. Again, I'm going to say that a lot today. It's about Jesus. It's, it's, it's his revelation. It's the revealing of who he is. It's about him, focused on him, centered on Jesus. It's a book about Jesus. It's the revealing from God's perspective. Okay, so it's, it's showing us things how God sees them, and that's, that's going to be full of imagery and symbols and ideas, and it's going to feel and look really, really uh, intense and crazy because it's a revealing from God's perspective. Number three, it's a prophecy. And so there are moments about the book that, that look forward and look into the future, and we're going to unpack that in a second. And lastly, it's a letter. And this is so, so important. This is a letter that John is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to a group of churches in, in Asia, in, in this certain province. So it's a letter with an intended audience with a specific idea these people need to hear this thing, so I'm writing them a letter. So let's unpack all of this stuff so that way we can uh, better understand this book, Revelation. So the first thing, let's talk about the letter aspect of the book. So John, again, he's writing a letter with, with an intended audience to a specific group of people about a specific issue. So, so in this time, in this, the first century world, Christians were being heavily oppressed by Roman rulership, okay? Roman, Rome, Rome was the superpower at the time, and Rome actually, for the most part, was pretty comfortable with everybody doing their own thing, and, you know, everybody can believe whatever they want to believe as long as you also worship Caesar, and as long as you also call Caesar Lord, which is a huge problem for Christians, because Jesus is Lord, and they only worship Jesus, and so being a Christian in that time was really dangerous, and, and Rome oppressed and was really cruel to Christianity. And so John is going to write a letter to a group of churches in this persecution, encouraging them. And here's how we're going to get through this. Here's how you're going to endure. But John does a genius thing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So smart. He writes a letter to them in Jewish apocalypse literature. So think about this. If, if John's writing this letter... That's, that's this huge encouragement to this church under this Roman oppression, saying, hey, one day Rome is actually going to fall. And all of these people, all these Roman rulers are nothing compared to Jesus. And you're going to get through this, and here's how you're going to get through this. 
if the Romans intercepted that letter, how bad do you think it would be for those churches? Like they were about to get encouraged to, to not like fall under the Roman rulership, right? That's, that's what that, that, that letter was for. And so if they had received or intercepted that letter, it would have been really, really bad for those churches. And so John writes in a language, in a style that the Romans know nothing about. So, so again, it's, think about it like this. So you've got uh, the last Star Wars movie just came out, episode nine. It was so-so, and um, that's my opinion anyway, my little movie critique moment. But um, there's a moment in there, and if you're, if you're a science fiction Star Wars nerd, right, there's a moment where Chewbacca gets a medal at the end of the movie. Now, if you've seen all those movies, you know exactly what that was. You're like, oh, I totally get it, right? But if you've never seen those, you don't really watch them that much, it was just a moment that passed you by, whatever. So the Romans don't like Star Wars, Right? And they got a letter that's written to them in Star Wars. And so they went, whatever. Like, I, this, this means nothing to me, so we can just pass this along. This is not an important letter. And then all of the Jewish people in those churches that were under that oppression, they love Star Wars. And they totally got it. And they got that letter, and it meant something to them. So John is writing a letter to a specific group of people on how to endure struggle and persecution as a Christian. And so when we think about the book of Revelation as only a book about the end times and it's only looking into the future, we miss a huge portion of what God has for us. So I'm going to say this, don't hurt me. If this book was only about the end times, it would be useless for every single Christian that's lived so far. If this book only had to do with what it's going to be like in the last days, how is that encouraging to me right here, right now? And every single Christian who's lived, what is this book supposed to do for them? One day, someday, this is going to go down. It's like, great, I guess. I, I haven't experienced it. But if this book is about how to actually get through really tough times as a Christian and how to you know, persevere and how to move forward, man, we need that. that. That's huge to us right here, right now in our world. So the book is a letter to a specific group of people about something. And that's so crucial to how we understand it. It means something to you and I right here, right now. So the other aspect of the book is prophecy, okay? And it said that in verse 3 of chapter 1, that it's a prophecy. So we're going to look at a really important rule, or the fancy Bible word is hermeneutic, which just means a way of thinking about something in the Bible. We're going to look at a rule about prophecy that Jesus shows us that's so important. And this is probably the most important, I think in my, in my point of view, this is the most important piece to understand the book of Revelation. So we're talking about prophecy. In the Old Testament, right, so Genesis uh, through all the prophets and kings up until the moment that Jesus was born, the Old Testament has all sorts of prophecies about the Messiah, all sorts of prophecies about Jesus and who he's going to be, what he's going to do. The, the people, the, the Jewish people were so looking forward to the Messiah coming. He was going to rescue them, bring them out of all of the struggle, and he was going to be their redeemer. So they're very much looking forward to the Messiah, and there's all of these prophecies about Jesus. And so there's, there's two camps that I'm going to describe, two groups of people and two different ways of interpreting and handling these prophecies, okay? First group of people is I'm just calling them, they're just excited, right? They're, they're looking at these prophecies and like, I am pumped for that. Like, I'm so looking forward to the day the Messiah comes. I don't know how it's all going to go down. And, and I, I'm not super educated in all of this stuff, and, and I don't know exactly how it's going to look or work, but I can tell you that I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. I'm pumped, right? So, so Peter is my example of this kind of guy. Peter is, he's uneducated. He's a fisherman, and he's, he's you know, grew up in that Jewish culture, that Jewish world, and so he's very excited the Messiah's coming. One day he's coming. I'm pumped. I'm excited. I don't know how it's going to look, but I'm really looking forward to it. So that's our first group of people, okay? The second group of people and I think a, sep a different camp of interpreting or understanding prophecies were the people that, no, they, they dug into it and they ripped those prophecies apart. And they went, okay, here's exactly who Jesus is gonna be, right? He's gonna be a military leader. He's gonna look like this. He's gonna act like this. Here's the timeline. Here's what he's gonna do, what he's gonna say, and how he's gonna act. And they completely had it all nailed down and they were closed about it. This is what he is. This is what he's gonna do. So my group of people here, my, to represent these people, are the Pharisees, right? Super educated, memorized the New Testament, okay? That's a lot of memory, okay? 
I wouldn't ever want to try. So they've memorized the Old Testament, and they know it, and they're in. I know exactly all the signs. I know how to interpret every symbol. I know exactly who, who the Messiah is going to be and what he's going to do. So the important question is which group of people did better when Jesus arrived? When Jesus finally showed up on the scene, which group of people did better when he got there? So two verses that I think illustrate it perfectly. So the first verse that we're going to look at is, um, let's see, uh, Matthew 23, 13. It says this. So this is Jesus again talking. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves and you don't let others enter either. So it's this huge moment. He's looking at these Pharisees, these people who have ripped the prophecies apart, and they know all about it. They know every detail about the Messiah. And Jesus, the Messiah, is looking at them and saying, you guys have missed it. And not only have you missed it, but you're so closed about it, and it has to be this way, that you're not even letting other people enter the kingdom of God, and you're keeping yourselves out as well. They've missed it. So here's Matthew 16, verse 15. So Jesus, the setting here is that he's in, the, in a location that is surrounded by temples and idols and there's all sorts of worship of false gods happening all around him. And he asks his disciples this question, Matthew 16, 15 through 16. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So Peter gets it, right? He's the guy who's just pumped. I'm excited. I don't know how to interpret all this, but I'm looking forward to it. And when Jesus stood there, the Messiah, and looked him in the eye and said, who am I? Jesus, or Peter knew, you're the Messiah. I get it. And so we need to ask ourselves, who do we want to be? What group do we want to live in in prophecy when it comes to the book of Revelation? Because I think overall, throughout church history and our culture, we have ripped this book apart. And we have interpreted every symbol. And we've looked into every single sign, every single piece of imagery, and we've said, I know exactly what's happening. I've got timelines. I know exactly what's going on. The locusts are helicopters. There's no doubt, right? The mark of the beast, Bill Gates is involved somewhere. The corona vaccine has the mark of the beast. If you get it, you're going to get the mark of the beast. I figured it out, right? Seven or eight U.S. presidents at this point have been the Antichrist, for sure, you know? Like, we just know it, and we've got it figured out. And we spin and we panic, and I think what we create, we wouldn't say this, it's not our intention, but I think what we create is fear. I think we create this idea of, this is all scary, this is all bad, and like the mark of the beast, just for an example, like so many people, so many Christians, I think would have the idea like, can I accidentally get that? Like if I don't understand Revelation correctly, am I accidentally going to go get a vaccine and then get the mark of the beast, and now I'm doomed forever? Like, that's a scary thought to have. And when we try so hard to make this so crystal clear and interpret every single sign, what we create is fear. And we create this idea of, if you don't have this thing exactly figured out, you're in trouble. And so Jesus, I think, teaches us this really important idea about prophecy, saying, look into it. I'm not telling you don't look into the book of Revelation, okay? I've got all sorts of my ideas and interpretations. That's a good thing to do. Study it. But be careful, and, and hold it kind of loose. And, and ultimately, my position is I'm really looking forward to when Jesus returns. And I'm really excited for when he comes back. I don't know how it's all going to look. Maybe they're helicopters. We don't know, right? Like, be careful with it. Because ultimately, what we need to know is that we should not be afraid. Right? There's, there's no room for fear in this. If you're in Christ, right, you, by, you, you've given your life to Jesus. You have faith in him, and he's given you your grace. There's no fear. I mean, amen. Like we, we are, there should be no fear about this. We're looking forward to this. So let's be careful. Let's treat it carefully and let's hold on to this idea loosely and let's just be excited. Like one day it's coming. Because that I think ultimately is what this book is really all about. And I think ultimately when you and I read the book of Revelation, what does it do for us? What should we take away from it? The book of Revelation gives us what I call all of God's ultimate moments. All of these ultimate decisions at the end of time that God shows. So um, I, I want us to look at some things here. So this ultimate hope, funerals do this all the time, okay? Funerals, I was just at a funeral recently and it was a, a lovely 
lovely service and it was amazing. And, and the, the pastor was, was talking and this is sort of the thing that's always said at funerals and it's so good and it's so true. Where, you know, he said, you know, we're sad right now. Of course we are. We've lost somebody that we love and, and we're mourning. But we have a hope, right? We have something to look forward to because if we believe in Jesus, we know this is not the end of the story, right? We have a, an eternal life together, right? I'm going to see this person again. This isn't the end of the story. So I have a hope that gets me through this moment of pain, gets me through what's going on right here, right now, because I can look forward to a day where God's going to bring this ultimate hope. So that's what the book of Revelation gives us, or God, God's ultimate moments, so I'm going to read right now Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. It's a, a bit of a bigger chunk of scripture, so read along with me, and then we're going to talk about it. So Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from, uh, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Probably one of the greatest passages of scripture ever, right? Like, it's this incredible moment, and what it is, is it's this ultimate hope that we have. And so there's so many things that this teaches us. So it's, it's ultimate victory. Like you and I, if we're if given our lives to Jesus, right, we, we're saved. We are experiencing and living in victory right now. Absolutely. Right? Jesus has died for us. We are living in his life. We have his righteousness. And sin no longer has a hold on us, no power on us. Okay? But there are lasting effects of sin that we still experience and endure together. There are moments where sin gets the best of us, and it brings shame and guilt, and it brings this heaviness on our life. And I'm so glad that I can, as a Christian, know there's a day where God is going to bring his ultimate victory on my life, and sin will, will be no more, and there will be no more chains on me. And there's going to be a day when this sin has no more effect, and there's no more shame, and there's no more guilt, and there's no more condemnation. I can know that day is coming. The book of Revelation gives me an ultimate victory that I'm looking forward to. And it helps me get through what I'm going through right now. Ultimate healing. Right? You, 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 like, you might be living your life right now, and you might have an illness or a disease. It's not fatal, but you've had it your whole life. And it's debilitating, right? It's painful. You, you have a constant sense of pain every single day. And I totally believe that God heals right here, right now. And I would pray with you, and I would, I would ask God to heal you, absolutely. But what I know, what the book of Revelation gives me is there is a day where God heals us. And every single pain, every single illness and sickness, God heals it. God makes it right, and we experience full restoration and full wholeness. God brings an end to sickness and disease, like, conclusively. It's final. It's done. Emotional healing. So many people, so many of us have had moments happen to us in life that are heavy and are difficult and they weigh on us and it feels like an overwhelming burden and they're things that we carry with us and God has the best for you right here, right now and God is healing you and God is bringing you into wholeness. But there's a day. God knows the day. And the book of Revelation shows us the day where all of the emotional weight and baggage that we carry, God handles it. And God wipes every single tear from our face. And he says, no more will this be an issue for you. I need that hope. I need to look forward to that. And then ultimate judgment and ultimate justice. Judgment might sound like a scary word. Can I just say, it's not a scary word. This is one of the greatest things that we get to look forward to. 
Again, because if you've given your life to Jesus, you have his righteousness, right? Judgment is a good thing. And so let's read this together. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 12, and then we're going to read verse 14 as well. So Revelation 20, 11 through 12. I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. And earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And then Revelation 20, verse 14. This is a part of that judgment scene. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. So here's this moment that, again, that God's revealing to us where death and the grave are are finally just taken care of, where everything is judged and God brings his ultimate justice. Let's just take a look through history for a second. Why is this a big deal? Let's think about the Holocaust for just a moment. One of the worst moments in human history. It's evil. It's awful. It's terrible. Ask anybody today, but ask any especially like devout Jewish person, has the Holocaust been dealt with justly? Are, are we in a sufficient place of justice on the Holocaust in today? Absolutely not. Like, it's, it's a moment that was so terrible. And yeah, it's over. Yeah, that was dealt with. But it's not been, ju- it's not been like, satisfied. There's still wrong there. It's not been dealt with sufficiently. Let's talk about slavery in America. Okay, ask any African-American person if slavery in America has been sufficiently dealt with. No. Has it been completely made right? Has, has the right amount of justice been brought down upon slavery? No. Also, there's more slaves today than there's ever been ever, right? Like, this, this is a problem. And the ramifications of that slavery are still, we're like seeing their ugly head up to this day. Has it been dealt with yet in its full form? No. Let's think about our world right here, right now. What's happening in our world? I would say the climate on social media over the last couple of months and weeks has been overwhelming. We've seen videos. Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. They never should have died never should have been murdered. We should have never seen those videos. They should have never happened. And those are just two names of a lot. And we need to make changes now, for sure. We need to change attitudes. We need to change behaviors. Things cannot stay the same. No way. But what I have, because of the book of Revelation, is a hope. There is a moment coming when these moments that seem overwhelming are dealt with. And God brings his justice. And he says, that was not okay. And I don't know how it's going to work. And I don't know how it's going to look. But I know it's coming. And I'm looking forward to the day where God shows up and says, that was not right. And I'm going to deal with it. And it's going to be sufficient and final. I cannot live my life thinking that the sin that is a part of me and and the sin that I deal with is going to have the last say someday. I cannot go through this life thinking that the diseases and illnesses that we experience are going to have the final say. And I cannot go through this life thinking that injustices, like we've seen over the last couple of months, go unanswered. I can't do it. And the book of Revelation says it doesn't go unanswered. And God brings it. And God says, I have ultimate victory. I have ultimate healing. And I have ultimate justice for you. Ultimately, what I think the book of Revelation is, is there's, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis that um, I love. It's from the Chronicles of Narnia. And I got a tattoo because of this quote. So there's the behind the scenes on my tattoos. Um, but they've, they've just gone into Narnia. It's from the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And they're sitting down in Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's house. And Mr. Beaver is sort of explaining to them, uh, you know, here's what's going on. Here's who Aslan is. And he starts describing Aslan. And he mentions that Aslan is a lion. And Susan gets a little frightened, and she's a little scared, you know? She's like, I've never met a lion before. And she says to Mr. Beaver, I hope he's tame. And Mr. Beaver stops and says, of course he's not tame. He's a lion, but he's good, and he's the king. 
And I think what Revelation shows us is God is not soft. God is not tame. Nothing escapes him. He sees it all. And I stand right here and I trust God in his ultimate wisdom. And I trust God in that he knows everything. And I trust him that, that he's got plans and purposes for right here, right now. But ultimately, I trust that there's a day when he makes it all right. And he takes every single thing that's gone on. And in his way and only the way that he can do it, he makes it right. God's not tame, but he's good and he's the king and he's coming and he's gonna make this broken world right and then you and I are gonna live in eternity together where there's no brokenness, there's no pain, there's no racism, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no sorrow. I need that hope. We need that hope right here, right now in this world that we're living in. It's God's ultimate moment. We're gonna pray together. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful for your power. God, we're we're grateful that that nothing escapes you. God, we thank you that you have a plan and a purpose, and God, you are perfect. God, we confess that there's brokenness. God, there's pain, there's hurt, there's all sorts of things that we are dealing with in our world. But God, right now, we as a community, God, as, as, as a community of believers, we come and we say we trust you. God, give us wisdom, give us insight. God, help us to change things in our world. But God, ultimately, give us a hope. God, give us a vision for what you have. God, we believe there is a day coming and we're excited for it. God, we confess right now, we don't know how it's gonna look. God, we don't know everything about it. That's for you to know. But God, we say we're excited. God, we are excited for when you come back. And God, you make all of the wrong things right. And God, you bring justice and you bring victory and you bring healing. God, for those of us right now that are in that place of overwhelming, whatever it is, God, we're in that place of, I don't know what I'm moving forward to. I don't have the hope. God, would you give them that hope? Remind them of how good you are. God, remind them that that Jesus came and died for them so that they could have the life that he lived free, abundant, righteous life. God, give us that hope. God, we love you. God, we trust you. God, we give you our moments. God, we give you the things that are happening in our world right now. God, we ask for your healing and God, we ask for your intervention. God, we ask for your wisdom. But God, give us the hope. Give us the vision. God, give us the endurance to keep moving forward. Jesus, we love you and we praise you and we worship you and it's in your perfect name that we pray, amen. Well, church, we're gonna go ahead and worship together one more time.
bless.